So at the cellular level, we could talk about uh, skeletal muscle. So earthworms have skeletal muscle just like we do. And so uh, skeletal muscle is a specialized group of cells. It's a specialized tissue. So we have specialized cells that are capable of contraction. And does anybody know um, what type of uh, uh, molecule, organic molecule, allows um, muscle cells to contract? What types of what type of organic molecules? Has anybody ever studied muscle contraction in in, in biology class? And there's a specific group of of, um, of molecules that are capable of contraction. contraction? You might not know this, okay? So muscle cells all have proteins called actin and myosin. So those are proteins, and proteins are coded for by genes, right? So we all have genes, all animals have genes, that code for actin and myosin. Okay. They might be slightly different, but in general, we have those genes that code for that. And so we can kind of, when we talk about unity, we can kind of create the relationships between organisms. So let's let's draw a little tree here. Okay. So this is a tree of showing evolutionary relationships, and this has a name. This is called a phylogeny. And phylogeny, um, a phylogeny shows the relationship between organisms. So, for example, we could have bacteria here. So, on this branch is my bacteria. My bacteria branched off really early. Okay. I could have plants here. Right. I could have earthworms here. And I could have humans here. Okay. So, when we get to... Uh, talking about anatomy and physiology of the different systems. We're going to spend a lot of time talking about um, uh, mammals, and in particular humans. So this is, shows unity, because there are certain characteristics that all of these organisms have. So I could actually put on my tree, I could put some characteristics that these organisms share. So here, I could put cells. Right? So what that means is, is that those cells arose, right? And they could be found in bacteria, plants, earthworms, and humans. The um, first cells that arose are called prokaryotic. Does anybody know what that means? What is a prokaryotic cell? How do they just, how do how they differ from? We are not made up of prokaryotic cells. So in this branch right here, I would put eukaryotic cells. Okay. So we actually believe that prokaryotic cells evolved first and eukaryotic cells evolve second. And the difference between those is the presence of a nucleus. 
So the eukaryotic cells have a good nucleus. Cary actually means nut. So that means a good nut, a good nucleus, and that is where the genetic material resides. Prokaryotic cells like bacteria do not have a nucleus. Their genetic material is just in their cytoplasm, and it's actually circular. It's plasmids instead of being chromatin and chromosomes. And so somebody put, or somebody mentioned that we have movements, right? So we have muscle right here. Okay. Now, the primary thing that distinguishes the us, um, humans, for example, from earthworms, is, is the fact that we have a vertebrae, right? So we're vertebrates, and earthworms are invertebrates. So I could put vertebrate right here. And I could put invertebrate. Right. So that's an invertebrate. So they actually have um, a nerve cord that runs down their belly. So it's on the surface, their anterior surface of their body or their ventral surface, where our spinal cord is in our back and it is um, protected by vertebrae. Okay, so this shows some unity um, and it also shows some diversity, right? So the difference between the prokaryotic cells and eukaryotic cells, the difference between vertebrates and invertebrates and plants, do not have muscles. They are, however, in, can, they can move a little bit. So like when you plant sunflowers, right? Sunflowers, if you watch them, they'll be pointing towards the east in the morning and they actually pivot and will be pointing towards the setting sun in the west. Okay, but they don't have muscle tissue per se. It's very different. Okay. Any questions about that idea about unity and diversity? No? Okay. Okay. So um, if you took Biology 211, you might have learned, I think uh, Dr. Um, McKeon, Sasha, teaches about microevolution. But because some of you weren't in 211, we're going to kind of go over the difference between microevolution and macroevolution. Okay? So for those of you who took 211, at what level does microevolution occur? Is it at the individual level? Is it at the population level? Is it at um, the species level? or a, even a higher level than that, like maybe a, a genus, not a genus, a genus or a um, class level. At what level does microevolution take place at? Does anybody remember? And I guess. Do individuals evolve in terms of uh, um, the way that we talk about evolution in biology? Individuals evolve. I hear that like in some other class. Okay, so microevolution is a change in a population over time. So a population is a group of individuals in, of the same species, right? And um, in that online lecture that I want you to watch, I talk about um, the taxonomic hierarchy, and I talk about what defines a species. But a species in general, it would be a group of organisms that could potentially reproduce 
and produce viable fertile, fertile offspring. And so humans are all of one species. And when we talk about species, we generally um, use what is called the binomial nomenclature. So species are designated with a binomial nomenclature. So what that means is two words. So what species are we? And what's the species name? Homo sapien. Homo sapien. Excellent. OK. So homo is always uppercase. And sapiens is always lowercase, right? So homo sapiens. That's an S-A. So this is actually our genus. And this is what is referred to as the specific epithet. But what you'll see when you, when you look at the scientific literature is, is that this is always underlined or italicized. Right? So if I am studying a specific species of mosquito and I write a scientific paper, I would use the mosquito's binomial nomenclature and um, anybody else reading that paper would know exactly what group of organisms I am talking about, right? Because they, um, this is the same no matter what the language, okay? So that's the, and it's always underlined, I should say underlined or italicized when you write it out. So when we talk about uh, microevolution, we have different mechanisms. And so one mechanism that you have probably have heard of is natural selection. So what this means is, is that some individuals have particular variation in their expression of their genes, particular traits that are advantageous and that would allow them to survive and reproduce, right? So I'm going to give you an example of natural selection um, in a video in a moment, and we'll talk about, um, we have a little sheet that we're, you're going to work on. Um, so natural selection is a mechanism of uh, microevolution. Okay. We also have some other mechanisms of microevolution, which include what is called genetic drift. My pen is just not working very well today. Let's see if I can. So natural selection is one mechanism. And genetic drift is another. So like it, it sounds, natural selection is non-random. So this is the non-random survival and or reproduction of individuals. Genetic drift, on the other hand, is random. Changes in a population. So think drift versus selection. One of those sounds random. Drift sounds a little random to me, right? Selection is non-random. So genetic drift happens randomly, and this could be due to a dramatic decrease in population size. dramatic decrease in a population size. And so that could be due to like a natural disaster, or it could also be due to over harvesting. 
So um, we could go out and we could um, kill or hunt a large proportion of the population. And the population that is left um, would be different than the one that was before, right? So this could be due to a natural disaster. It's just something that is more random. And over or over hunting. Sometimes this is what is referred to as the bottleneck effect, where populations go through, they decline dramatically, and um, then they repopulate, and they're very different. And this is really an important mechanism in terms of conservation biology, because what we're seeing is, is that populations are being reduced, and then as conservation biologists, we want to reestablish a population but the genetic diversity might have dramatically changed or declined because they went through what is referred to as the bottleneck effect. We also have another example of where a few individuals found or established a new population. So when we talk about biodiversity, we're going to talk about what happens on, on islands, for example. So biogeography is the distribution of species across the planet. And what we find in, on islands is oftentimes there's really unique diversity on islands. Because what happens is, is that an island, like a volcanic island that arises in the middle of the ocean, doesn't have any species on it until species colonize it. And so a few individuals might land on an island and then those individuals found the entire new population and it could be that they are just different just because of which individuals were the ones that were to colonize the population. And this is actually um, is found in um, humans as well, right? So we have human populations that have very unique um, variation because only a few individuals founded that population. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to watch a video and I'm going to hand out the sheet. Um, you could um, work on it or you could just wait because we're going to get together in groups to answer these questions about microevolution. Okay, I'm really hoping this is going to work here. Let's pause that. Okay. So let's talk about this example. So did the rock pocket mice mutate um, because of the dark coloration of the soil. Did they mutate because of that? No. So remember that mutations are random. So under define a mutation, you need to have the word random. And mutations are change in the genetic material or the DNA. So one of the misconceptions of um, evolution is, is that, and it's probably because we, you know, we see it in science fiction all the time, is that organisms mutate towards a goal. And that is not true. So the mutations have to be present. So there has to be variation present in the population to begin with. And so the interesting thing about that uh, particular gene 
is that it is a, um, a switch. It's rather than, it doesn't actually code for the pigment itself, but the gene that causes the mice to become dark turns that gene on and makes, um, they produce more pigment, right? So they become darker. So that variation is actually in a control gene that controls the production of pigment. Okay, so um, that actually answers number two. So that would be false. So the environment did not cause the mice to mutate towards a goal. What kind of gene was mutated? That was, it was, actually wasn't too clear in the video, but that is actually a switch that turns another gene on. So if that mutation happens and the mouse happens to be living on lightly colored sand, then that would be deleterious, right? So if I was a if I was born a light colored mouse and I lived my entire life on light colored sand, excuse me, if I was born dark and I lived on light colored sand, that would be a deleterious mutation. So mutations can be good, they can be bad, and they can also be neutral. In some cases, actually, there's lots of mutations that occur that actually do not change um, an individual's outward appearance or expression at all, right? So mutations don't always cause a change in the individual. So can dark coloration evolve twice in two separate species? Yes, okay. So if we look at uh, one possibility, if we looked at this evolutionary tree, and let's say we had light colored mice, okay, and then we have two populations of dark. Okay, so that's um, a possibility. And if we um, had dark coloration evolve here, right? That means that the dark coloration only evolved once. And so the mutation should be the same. So if the mutation was the same, it was probably passed down and those two dark color populations um, uh, were evolved because of a common ancestry. Right? They're dark because of a common ancestry. Is that what happens in, from the video? Is that what, we, that what they saw in the video? No, right? So what they actually saw was something that looked like this, where we had light, and we have dark, and we have dark, right? So the mutation wasn't in the ancestral population, but it evolved independently, right, in two populations. And so we had two separate evolutionary events that led to dark colored mice in two separate populations. Now, are the light and the dark mice, are they um, of the same species or are they different species? Same species, right? Because they could potentially interbreed. There's nothing keeping them from mating with each other and producing offspring. Um, if for some reason they became more isolated geographically, you could have them becoming different species. But that would not be microevolution. So remember that microevolution, um, and we'll talk about the difference between micro and macroevolution. Macroevolution is where we get the evolution of new species. And what was the other? Oh, did somebody get the back? Did you guys get the back? There was only the front? Ah, there's supposed to be a back. Oh, well. Okay, I was wondering how you finished that so quickly. <laughs> it's like, wow, they're fast. Okay, are there any questions about this example of microevolution? Okay, so we're gonna now talk about macroevolution and we are going to be talking about the diversity of animal life. And this is where we're going to talk about the mechanisms of macroevolution. But the first thing we're going to do is we're going to define it. So macro 
means at a greater scale, not just within populations, but um, the evolution of new species, oops, evolution of new species. So this could be called speciation. Right? or other major groups. So if you study um, geography, and specifically like paleontology, where we study the fossil history of um, the major groups of um, animals, you, if you've ever studied geography, you know that there are certain layers of sediments, right, that are in, on the earth, and we can actually date those sediments. So the, generally, if the sediments are, are, are on top of each other, the older layer is deeper than the newer layer, right? So this would be like sedimentary rock. And so what we see within the fossil record is we see that at some point on our planet, there were only certain types of animals. And so in the older fossil records, we might find fish. Okay. So fish were the only vertebrates that are found in that older layer of rock. And from the fish, when we go up to a, a, a newer layer, we then see amphibians. Right? So amphibians like, um, and there was actually a point in time where we had the age of the amphibians. And so you might see giant salamanders in the fossil record. They're like this big, right? They're huge, right? Frogs are also amphibians, salamanders, newts, right? And then we see the evolution of reptiles. And we have the age of the reptiles, and that would include the dinosaurs, right? And something that's interesting that has come about recently is as they've reclassified birds. Birds used to be in a separate group, but now they call them reptiles. So birds are in the reptilian group, okay? In the reptilian class, actually. And so then, we have mammals. So we have like the age of the mammals. So after we saw that mass extinction of the dinosaurs, then we saw a diversification of the mammals, right? And so this would be an example of macroevolution would be like um, mammals evolving from a reptilian ancestor. Okay. So that's the idea of macroevolution. So we're going to talk quite a bit about macroevolution and the mechanisms of this. Um, but before we do that, I want to talk about the scientific method. And so we're going to spend some time talking about the scientific method. And um, you're going to use a specific example. Okay, we're going to use a specific example of this. So I'm sure most of you are familiar with the scientific method, we've been exposed to this before. Um, it's really important to realize that as we move through the parts of the scientific method, that it is not always conducted in a linear fashion, that you could have a hypothesis which could lead you to um, um, have new questions. You could do an experiment which could make you completely change your hypothesis, right? But generally, what starts out with the scientific method is our observation. Okay, so we make an observation. So the example that we are going to use um, is um, coloration in a young of a type of um, bird called an American coot, which is, they're actually kind of related to um, ducks. I don't think, I think they do not have webbed feet, if I remember correctly. If you are a bird watcher, you might have 
by recognize this animal. So um, one of the ways to tell the American coot from other birds is that they have a very white bill. So if we look at, I know you can't see that very well in your picture. Okay. So this is what the coot looks like. So it's actually more related to um, um, not ducks, but actually, what are those called? Is it? I can't remember the basic. Anyway, so the observation is that if you look at the coloration of their chicks, they are quite dramatic, right? And you can see them. And that is kind of counterintuitive. When we think about bright plumage on birds, oftentimes what we think about is, is that males are trying to attract females, right, with, with bright plumage. And so the question is, why do the chicks have bright plumage? And so you might write down as your observation that the chicks are brightly colored. That's your observation. So the question, obviously, is what is the advantage of them being brightly colored? So you could have your question. So you have your observation, and then you have your question. What is the advantage? Because there seems to be a big disadvantage, right? The disadvantage is, is, is that if we can see them, perhaps uh, predators would also be able, they're not very camouflaged, right? So that would be the question. And then your hypothesis is an educated guess. And sometimes we mistakenly call these theories. But it is not a theory until it is well supported by huge amount of evidence. So your hypothesis is your educated guess. Okay. So looking at the title of this paper, what do you think it might be the advantage? What was that? So the mother can see them. Better. The mother can see them. If I am more brightly colored than my sibling, what might my mother do for me that they that she would not do for the sibling? Pay attention to it more. Could do what? Pay attention to it more. Pay attention to it more, and possibly what do mothers provide? Birds don't have mammary glands, right? So they have to feed their offspring, right? So the educated guess is is that the brightly colored, the more brightly colored the chick the offspring, the more food it will obtain from its parent. Okay, so there's a little bit of competition going on between these offspring for attention from the parent. Why might it be good for the, um, for the parent to distinguish between a brightly colored chick and a one that's not so bright? What might bright color signify? The health of the chick. Health, right? So if the chick is unhealthy, it's probably going to not be very bright. And um, it might also, they discovered that the more parasites um, birds have, the less brightly colored their plumage is, right? So a brightly colored chick signifies that that is a healthy chick. And so maybe the mother should feed it more. Chicks also sometimes beg differently, so healthier chicks are also able to beg more forcefully, right? So maybe it has nothing to do with that. Maybe the more brightly colored chick could be better at begging, right, than a dull chick, and they just happen to be correlated. So causation and correlation, right? It's not always um, the, the, what the mother is, is actually detecting. Okay, so then we have the experiment. Okay. So when we have our experiment, we have variables. So I'll put variables on this side. You don't have to write it down. Okay, so we have what is called the independent variable. And so we'll be going over this a lot. And I will give you examples of experiments 
And I really want you to be able to tell me the difference between the variables. So this takes a little bit of practice. So this is what you alter experimentally. So if your hypothesis is, is that the mother is queuing into the coloration, what much might you alter? What could you do to those chips? That wouldn't be too hot. <laughs> you could dye them, right? You could dye them black, right? But it just so happens that you can actually take a pair of scissors, right? And you can trim off all of the orange, right? So this would be the coloration. If you cut off all the orange feathers, then they're all black, right? There's no difference, okay? So that would be the coloration would be what you would manipulate. And then you have the dependent variable. So this is what you measure. So what might you measure Yes, yeah, so how many times the mother feeds the chicks, right? Feeding rate. You can also weigh the chicks, right? So you can see how fast they are growing, right, relative to one another. So that would be what you would measure. And then the control would keep, would be everything that you would keep constant that could influence, right? So this is what you keep constant. Okay. And in this case, we could have control variables, but they also have a control treatment, which I'll explain in a minute. But a control variable would be, you would probably um, um, want to use siblings, right? They're genetically related because perhaps if you start swapping birds between nests, Maybe the parent would be able to detect that that wasn't their offspring, right? And that might screw up your results. Or you could always give the parents um, chicks from a different individual, right? So you would want to keep the relationship between the parent and the chicks constant, okay? You might want to also, you know, keep your observations, what, how you are recording, how you're taking data, constant, right? You would want to keep the time of day when you're making these measurements constant. Uh, every method that you use, would want you would want to be the same. Okay, so after we conduct the experiment, or when we're conducting the experiment, we could actually come up with a hypothesis and so this is one of the, um, on one of the sheets, this is the first one, the first graph on page three. And so I wanted to explain what the control broods are. So the control broods are that there's only orange chicks or there is only black chicks. They are not mixed, right? So this is actually a control treatment. So you might want to write that down. So this is my control treatment. Okay. So there's only orange or black. My experimental treatment would be that there's black and orange. Right. So now we have some competition that could possibly, and some uh, something that we've, we've experimentally manipulated, that there that there's black and orange when there would only always be orange, right? There's no black black chicks just don't are even present in the environment, right? But we can cut off all the orange feathers and make them black. Okay. So what this represents. 
these are bar graphs, right? And what this represents is the average, right? And then this re represents the, like, it's kind of a, comp it's called a confidence interval. You don't need to know that. But this represents, it's a statistic, and it kind of represents um, the variation that you might see, right? So you could expect to see, on average, um, that you would have 0.2 feeds per chick per minute, right? But it wouldn't be totally out of the question to see 0.4 feeds per chick per minute. So this is your feeding rate. So this is um, the hypothesis chart. And so if, the, um, if there are only orange chicks and black chicks, I would predict that these would be same. They would be the same, right? Because if there's no selection by the parent, right, the feeding rate should be about the same for orange chicks and black chicks. If orange and black are the only ones that are present. Does that make sense to everybody? So that's my educated guess. Now, if orange and black chicks were um, in the uh, nest together, which ones do you think would have a higher feeding rate? Orange, right? So I might predict that orange would be up here and black would be like down here. Right. Same thing with growth rates, right? I might predict that the orange would be high and the black would be low. And then the percent surviving, I might think, think the same thing, that like maybe 70% of the orange chicks survive and maybe like only 50% of the black chicks survive. So that's my hypothesis, right? That's what I think might happen. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, so if I look at the results, which are on the next page, this is what we see, right? So if there's only black and orange chicks, so orange chicks, the surviving survival rate is the same, right? Is there no significant difference? But you notice there still is a lot of variation, you know? Um, so it's kind of weird that there's so much variation. See the survival rate. You know, it might be that handling the chicks. I wonder, you would want to try to handle them the same amount. You want to try to handle the orange chicks as much as you do the black chicks. But it looks like there's more, a little bit more variation in a percent surviving for the black chicks and the orange chicks. But then if you look at when the parents are given a choice, you notice that in most cases, and they say that this is uh, using a statistic, it is significantly different, right? So there's significantly more uh, feeding of orange chicks, growth rate of orange chicks, and surviving compared to the black chicks. So in conclusion, right, it appears that coloration is what the parents are cueing in on rather than begging. Like if, 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 if some chicks were better able to beg, you know, you would expect that if you cut the orange off of them, that there would be no difference between the orange and the black, right? So it appears that this appears to be the, maybe the reason, right? It's not a theory, right? It's just still a hypothesis. The data supports the hypothesis. The data did not prove the hypothesis. So it's really important to note that, like, actually proving something is pretty much impossible in biology, right? We don't talk about proving stuff. We talk about the evidence supporting the hypothesis. Are there any questions about that example? Okay, great.
Okay. So the last thing we'll talk about today is how we would go about determining how organisms are related to one another. So we believe that there's unity in the relationships between all animals, but trying to figure out how they are related is a different matter. So um, <clears throat> one way that this was done in the past is by looking at structural similarities. Now, this could also be called morphology. Okay. So this is also morphology. So can anybody tell me why this might not be the best way to go about determining evolutionary relationships? What about those rock pocket mice? Did you see the same trait evolving independently? The black coloration evolved twice independently. Okay. So the problem with using structural similarities is a problem with convergent evolution. So convergent evolution is where organisms evolve similar traits independently of one another. Right? So my favorite example of this is the northern flying squirrel and sugar gliders. So we have northern flying squirrels around here. I know that's because my cat, unfortunately, used to kill northern flying squirrels when we lived upriver. These live in pine trees, and they come down in the evening to eat lichen off of the ground and off of the trees. Okay? Um, they are very similar in their structure to sugar gliders. Does anybody know where sugar gliders are from? Sometimes you see lots of YouTube videos about sugar gliders because they are so darn cute. Sugar gliders are marsupials. And so where are they probably from? Australia. Is Australia is where the land of the marsupials, right? So these are Australian marsupials. So we're going to talk about what marsupials are. They have a different reproductive strategy. They um, produce very underdeveloped offspring. And the offspring develop um, attached to a nipple or in a pouch, right? And so Australia. Um, drifted off by itself a long time ago, and the marsupials and the other mammals um, evolved independently of one another. But when we look at their structure, they look so similar. Right? So there's my sugar glider, and there's my flying squirrel. So they have that flap of skin between the forearm and the hind limb. They're very flat. And then these guys have a really flat tail that allows them to jump and glide between trees. So these are not closely related at all, but if you were looking at them from just a structural point of view, just what they look like, their morphology, you might think that they are related. Okay. So we have to use some other means of determining relationships. So one way that we can determine relationships is by looking at biogeography. So this is the distribution 
of organisms in the environment. So we know that the continents shift and there's plate tectonics. We know that at one point in time, all the continents were together in Pangaea and they drifted apart. So we know when Australia diverged and became isolated as an island. And so using biogeography, we would say that the northern flying squirrels and the sugar gliders are probably not closely related at all because they are so ge geographically separated from one another. The third thing that we can look at is fossil records, so fossils. Sometimes we see transitional fossils, right? Transitional fossils that are, um, um, that have characteristics of one group and characteristics of the other. So characteristics of both groups. Does anybody know the most famous example of a transitional fossil that um, Darwin um, hypothesized would be found, but wasn't actually found until after he died, right after he died? There's a transitional fossil between a reptile and a bird, and it is called Archaeopteryx. Okay. So it's a reptile slash bird. Interestingly, it has claws. So birds actually have a modified forearm. Birds do not have claws on their wings, but Archaeopteryx did. Okay, so it has claws on its wings. It also has teeth. Modern day birds have lost their teeth. And Archaeopteryx also has a uh, vertebrae into its tail. All modern day birds um, lack vertebrae in their tail. So they just have feathers. And so like the big feathers of um, the peacock, they don't have any bones in them. They're just simply feathers, the tail feathers. So reptile slash bird would be that transitional fossil. So sometimes we see really interesting um, evolutionary trees that look something like this. This is one of my favorite ones. Um, this shows the evolution of elephants. And so if you look at the elephants in this, we're going to talk about what this is. This is called a cladogram you'll see that there's only three um, species that are still alive today. So the mammoths were related to the modern day elephants, but they went extinct at the, last ice, at the end of the last ice age, right? But then we see some really interesting fossils of weird things happening, like this shovel tooth, right? Um, this one is kind of weird looking, right? And then if we go back for far enough, we see some organisms that are smaller in size. Okay, so we could use the transitional. This is really interesting. When we look at um, the um, organisms that are closely, that we believe to be most, most closely related to the modern day elephant, it is the manatee. So those are aquatic, right? Sea cows. And then what is called a rock hyrax. So this relationship is really interesting, the rock hyrax. And just by looking at the fossil record, you can't really see how the rock hyrax might be related to elephants, but they have some interesting characteristics. And one of the really interesting things about these rock hyraxes, I think, is, is that they live in Africa and the local people actually hypothesized that they were related to um, elephants. So the indigenous people actually thought they were little elephants. And the reason for this is because um, they have, um, it's hard to see here this, but they have actually little tusks. 
So they have incisors, so they're like these little organisms, these little animals that have tusks. And then they have a foot pad that is very similar to the elephant's foot pad. I, oh, here's a better picture. So these little tusks, right? And so the indigenous people actually thought they were related to the elephant. The manatees also have um, very similar structures on their feet, these toe pads that are found on elephants as well. Okay. So this relationship is actually not just based upon fossils or structures, but the um, way that we, we determine evolutionary relationships these days is through um, molecular genetics. So what number am I on? Four. Okay, so molecular genetics. And so you can do this with proteins, but it's more commonly done with DNA. So the more similar the DNA between two organisms, the more closely related they are. And they don't just look at any uh, DNA. They look at specific sequences that might not change very readily, that do not mutate very rapidly. So they look at um, maybe really important genes um, that are found in all animals. And then they compare the, any mutations and the, the more similar they are in their sequences of nucleotides, the A's, the T's, the G's, and the C's, the more closely they would put them together on um, the, um, the evolutionary tree. So the molecular evidence suggests that rock hyraxes and manatees are the most closely related organisms um, that are alive today to the modern elephant. Okay, so I'm going to stop there for today. And so I would like to remind you that there is that introductory lecture, I think it's like 45 minutes, that um, specifically, if you didn't take 211, you probably want to watch that because it covers the information in chapter one of the textbook.